everybody, it's George Whittam reporting for Whittam's World. Sorry it's been so long since you've seen me here. I've been on all these conventions, had a lot of coverage from them, so I'm back to answer questions like the old days. Remember when I used to do that? I do still answer questions here. <laughs> I'll tell you at the end how you can send in yours. But this question came in from John Keeney, he's one of my clients, and uh, you know it goes into a little bit of detail about how to use processing when creating a stack or a rack. So let's get into what he's asking about. It's a few parter. So first he says, some folks might find it conf somewhat confusing or daunting to set up a well put together processing chain in their DAW. Of course, without the use of an engineer like me. We'll talk about that in a minute. What should and shouldn't go into a VO processing chain? What is the correct order to add required effects? Do you normalize first or after you apply? And do you do noise reduction or correction before or after you apply the processing chain? And lastly, do you adjust the processing chain for where the final product will be played, whether it's on YouTube, the web, radio, TV, etc.? Thanks. Well, you know, this is a pretty complicated question, so I can't go into a ton of detail, and I do teach webinars that cover this, but I do want to at least show you what I put in a rack. And, you know, I'm going to show you settings that I use, and these are proprietary settings based on whom I'm working with, what their voice sounds like, what size room they're in, what style of delivery they're doing, how loud they read, a lot of different factors. So the settings that I'm going to show you are going to be relevant to whomever I set these up for. Okay. So that being said, I found an audio sample that John had sent me sometime last year, dropped it into Adobe Audition, since that happens to be what John uses. And let me show you some of the settings that I use. He said, you know, I, maybe it's a best practices thing. Like what sequence should I put these things in? I know that you do all these processes in a certain order, but what sequence should I be doing them in? And he provides two examples, example one and example two. Well, based on what I'm seeing here, example one is probably, probably the closest to the one I would normally want to do. In example one, you can see we've got A or one, first step, normalized to minus three. Then if necessary, and you want to use noise reduction, this would be the time to do it. Then if you really need to use a declicker, this would be the time to do it. Then a manual or automatic debreathing function. I'm not a big fan of doing this, but if you feel for the genre you're doing and your style of reading has a lot of gasping breaths, debreathing might be the next thing you're gonna do. Then we would do the editing. That's not in his steps here, but after declicking and debreathing, then you would do editing for content probably. You'd probably do that at the same time you're doing the debreathing. You'd kind of do them along as you go. After you have a final edit, then you'd use your processing chain. And I'll show you an example of a chain that I would use for, uh, for you know a lot of the audio processing that I do for voiceover. And then finally, at the end of that, normalize. Now, using Audition, we don't have to do a final normalize pass because the limiting step has a normalize function where it sets a ceiling and it won't go above it. So let me show you what I slap into Audition and you can get an idea of what you might find useful for your processing. So once we get through those first few steps, we've done the editing, now it's time to process. And here's an example of a rack that I might do or use on somebody's voice. This is not necessarily the one I would have made for John, but I'll show you an example. So this particular uh, one starts off with a high pass filter. I use the FFT filter because it's an extremely blunt instrument that if used correctly will eliminate all the rumble in the recording, but if used incorrectly will really make your sound anemic. So you gotta be really careful about where you set this cutoff frequency and how steep you roll off that cutoff frequency. As you can see, it's very, very steep cutoff that I'm using here on this particular setting. So you're gonna adjust that frequency to taste. Uh, so you're eliminating low end rumble resonance, but keeping the richness of the voice. The next thing I would usually have is a tube model. Well, I use the tube model compressor. You can use whatever compressor you want, but this is the next thing that I usually have in my chain. Generally two to one ratio, threshold minus 18 to minus 25, a little less, a little more, season to taste. You know, this is like, I can be a, I can teach you how to cook, I just can't teach you how to season to taste. That is the stuff that takes many years of experience and I can do that for you. I'll tell you in a minute how I do that. Um, the next thing I put in my chain or rack 
or in the world of Twisted Wave stack is um, going to be my downward expander or gate. Um, in addition, there's no dedicated expander tool. So I just use the Dynamics processor and I find the frequency, or not the frequency, but the threshold cutoff where it leaves the full voice with most of the breath, but will reduce the room noise. And how much I reduce the no room noise is determined by this control down here where I set the ratio. And my ratio uh, it would rarely go above two unless it's a real severe noise issue. It's usually be between 1.8 and two to one. Again, seasoning to taste. After all the dynamics processing is when EQ comes in. This is a pretty wacky EQ curve. It's much more radical than I would probably use for most people. But the reason this EQ curve is the way it is is because this particular uh, voice actor studio had some major deficiencies and I had to dial in some uh, things we call notches to get rid of resonances and reflections in his studio. Did it work perfectly? Probably not, but this probably helped the situation, at least the best that I could do, given the source audio. So this EQ curve um, I built for that particular voice, and no EQ is going to be a generic thing that you can just slap in. Has to be dialed in very carefully, to fit your voice, microphone, acoustics, room size, things like that. Then um, I'm gonna slide one more thing in here because you'll see I have hard limiter at the end. That always is the last thing. Always, always, always is at the end. But there may be some sibilance left over at the end of all this processing um, in a severe uh, sibilance case. So in uh, Adobe Audition 6 and higher, there's a beautiful de -er tool so then I would dial in my de by finding the center frequency of the sibilance that I want to get rid of, how much of a wide frequency range I want, or the bandwidth, and then how much I want it to reduce by adjusting the threshold. And I would get that de dialed in. That I only use that for someone that is extremely sibilant. Um, I've usually handled it quite nicely using the parametric equalizer by reducing high-end frequency, as you see here, or putting a little notch in the somewhere between 6 and 10K range to flatten out the person's a sibilant voice. At the very, very end of all that, that's where the hard limiter comes in. How much you limit is completely based on the style, the genre you're working in. Um, audiobooks need a lot of limiting because they have very wide dynamic range and need to be brought up a lot in terms of average volume. So I use a lot of input boost on an audiobook. 10 dB, 12, sometimes 15 dB is going to be necessary to bring a really long audiobook chapter into the RMS levels that audiobook producers want or publishers want. But I set the maximum amplitude at minus three. Again, based on the style or the genre or the client's request, you're going to choose the maximum amplitude. I almost always use minus three. If somebody wants it to be limited to a lower amount, aka normalized to a lower amount, this is synonymous with normalization. So if you set this to minus six, it will be as though you've normalized it to minus six. I'm gonna use minus three because that's what uh, I find works well and engineers never seem to complain about levels that peak at minus three. Gives them that last three dB of wiggle room or headroom to play with. So that is the sequence in which I place all my processing tools into the system. So I do normalize first, which I have under the key N, brings up to minus three. And then I simply apply my rack. So the raw audio is going to sound like this. Cisco WebEx Training Center gives my team everything we need to deliver. And the processed audio will sound like this. Cisco WebEx Training Center gives my team everything we need to deliver. A rich online classroom experience that feels just like in-person training. That's a lot of limiting. You can see the waveform flattened out at the very top. It might be misconstrued as clipping, but the limiter is actually giving us the ability to get the levels really hot without clipping. Would this be the right amount of limiting for your project? I don't know that. And some projects require no limiting or they really want none at all. Others require a lot. Um, again, audiobooks, a lot of limiting. Radio stuff, stuff for the radio, stuff for broadcast, radio, they tend to limit the heck out of it and make it as hot as possible. But other genres like commercial are going to be a little bit more natural with a little bit less of that. Um, 
it just it varies and it really is a thing of taste it's a matter of producer's taste if as if you're the voice actor who's having to put all the the tracks together and make a final product you're the producer and it comes down to your taste and how it works with the client's needs so anyway i showed you a lot of settings i showed you the order i put them in but the question is is how the heck are you going to figure out what those settings are going to be i highly highly recommend that you go ahead and take advantage of my Stacks and Racks uh, service. I can put together uh, on our website all of the processing tools that you need to get the sound that you desire to get. And if you wanna get that for yourself, I'm gonna put a little plug here for our services right here at vostudiotech.com where all of our technical support and training is located. If you look under services with George Whittem, you can check out our service called Customized Recording Presets, Stacks and Racks. If you click on that, you'll notice, hey, there's a special, that's right. Normally Stacks and Racks are 75 bucks, but for the entire month of July, from basically until the time you see this till the end of July, we're offering Stacks and Adobe Racks for 49 bucks. Pretty killer deal. So you'll, if you just read the page, you'll see all the services I provide and what you're gonna get in exchange for your hard-earned cash. There's no better deal out there in terms of getting an engineer to virtually process your audio for you and teach you how to make use of those tools. You can order more than one if you do a lot of genres. If you do, uh, if you do animation and then and animation and video games, which are similar, and you do audiobooks, and you do commercials, and you do e-learning, if you do all these different genres, they all have little bit differences in the way that they're processed. So you might con may consider buying a few of them up front so that uh, you have a few different styles to work with. So I hope that was helpful to you guys. Thanks again, John Keeney, for your question. And if you've got a question for me to answer here on Widom's World, just send it in to widomsworld at edgestudio.com. If you've got technical support needs, as I showed you, go to vostudiotech.com, where I've got a wide range of services available to help you out and a whole team of people available to assist you when I'm booked up, which I can be sometimes. And you can also just give us a call at 1-818 at 1-212-868-3343. And operators are standing by, well, at least during normal business hours. Anyway, my name's George Whittem again. Thanks for watching Whittem's World, and I'll see you guys next week with another edition. Thanks again. Bye. Coffee!